Welcome, everyone. Hello. We're just going to wait like another minute or two to get folks rolling in because those participant numbers are going up and up and up, which is great. That's what we want. But if you uh, if you didn't chat from the director of the Opaka Gallery, uh, Judy Gilmore, please mute your microphones. I also want to mention that we are recording this, this lecture tonight, just to give everyone a heads up. Everyone doing okay? Yeah, excited, good. One of my students, I was laughing because one of my students was like, oh, that's what your face looks like because I'm usually like this to them. <laughs> so we're laughing about that, like seeing each other for the first time. Aww. <laughs> Well, what do you think? Should we do this? Should we get going? Feels like we should. Sure, yeah, I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Welcome everyone. This is an exciting turnout. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Mindy McDaniel and I'm a professor in the Art and Extended Media Program. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Scrimshaw Distinguished Visiting Artist Lecture with Rudy Shepard. Uh, before we really get going, though, um, there are some folks that we'd like to thank who've made Rudy's visit with us possible tonight. Uh, first and foremost, the former Sage College president, Susan Scrimshaw, uh, the Visual and Performing Arts Department. And I'd like to do like a special thank you to Professor, Professor Sean Hoovendick, who's been our guide in arranging all of this, who's been awesome. Uh, the Opauka Gallery, uh, also Shameless plug, the Opaka Gallery is open, so uh, you can come and visit safely and see the amazing uh, photo regional, which is all uh, student work, which is really exciting. Uh, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, the Office of Donor Relations, and the Office of Marketing and Communications. Um, I also want to add that after Rudy's talk, there's going to be a panel discussion with several of our amazing SAGE students. They have great questions for Rudy ready to go to keep the conversation going um, and uh, also to help uh, ease you all into asking your questions too. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce Rudy. Uh, Rudy Shepard received a BS in biology and studio art from Wake Forest University and an MFA in sculpture from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. Uh, Rudy's work explores the nature of evil through the mediums of painting, drawing, and sculpture. This exploration involves investigations into the lives of criminals and victims of crime. The complexity of these stories and the gray areas between innocence and guilt are expressed through a series of paintings and drawings of both the criminals and victims making no visual distinctions between the two. Going along with these portraits is a series of sculptures called the Black Rock Negative Energy Observers, meant to remove negative energy from people, allowing them to respond to life with the more positive aspects of their personality. We do need a lot of that in our lives right now. Um, uh, I had this amazing experience in 2015 15 at the Three Rivers Arts Festival in Pittsburgh, where I was miss to one of these Black Rock negative energy absorbers. And there was this performance by this figure who seemed to knight its powers. Uh, I was moved and impressed by the magic I could feel from this experience. Uh, and the others who gathered around us uh, could feel it too. 
So I'm excited for you to hear from Rudy. So without further ado, please just temporarily unmute your connection to give him a warm welcome. Oh, that's nice. I like that. I've never, <laughs> never had that before. <laughs> Zoom applause. Cool. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rudy Shepard, and uh, I really hope that my connection is okay. Um, I've unmuted myself. So, you know, first faux pas, I've got through that. Um, I want to start the talk by um, sharing somebody else's work. Actually, I'm going to share a video of Nikki Giovanni reading a poem. Um, I listen to this uh, when I work in my studio. I like listen to podcasts and just whatever I can to keep my mind focused and uh, enjoy what I'm doing. And I, I listened to this interview with her and the interviewer talked about this poem and you know they read little pieces of it and then I went and I watched this video and it like moved me to tears and it just really like inspired me and so I wanted to share that and it sort of relates to my work for sure in a way and and um I don't know I just think it'll be and I like to do weird things so it just <laughs> make each one of these different so I wanted to share something that uh I've never shared before uh that I just the type of things that I find inspiring so we'll see how it goes hold on let me i don't think i did that audio thing so let's do the share sound grab the video again and here we go and hopefully we won't get a commercial from zoom uh the video the video is not that important it's really just her standing there talking so hopefully just the audio at least works but the video is a little laggy so here we go I wrote a poem, Quilting the Black Eyed Pea, We're Going to Mars. We're going to Mars for the same reason Marco Polo rocketed to China, for the same reason Columbus trimmed his sails on a dream of spices, for the very same reason Shackleton was enchanted with penguins, for the reason we fall in love. It's the only adventure. We're going to Mars because Perry couldn't go to the North Pole without Matthew Henson, because Chicago couldn't be a city without Jean-Baptiste de Savo, because George Washington Carver and his peanut were the right partners for Booker T. It's a life-seeking thing. We're going to Mars because whatever is wrong with us will not get right with us. So we journey forth carrying the same baggage, but every now and then leaving one little bitty thing behind, maybe drop torturing hunchbacks here, maybe drop lynching Billy Bud there, maybe not whipping Uncle Tom to death, maybe resisting global war, one day looking for prejudice to slip, one day looking for hatred to tumble by the wayside, one day maybe the whole community will no longer be vested in who sleeps with whom. Maybe one day the Jewish community will be at rest, the Christian community will be content, the Muslim community will be at peace, and all the rest of us will get great meals on holy days and learn new songs and sing in harmony. We're going to Mars because it gives us a reason to change. If Mars came here, it would be ugly. Nations would band together to hunt down and kill Martians. And being the stupid, undeserving life forms that we are, we would also hunt down and kill what, we would, what would be termed Martian sympathizers. As if the fugitive slave law wasn't bad enough then, as if the so-called war on terrorism isn't pitiful now, when do we learn and what does it take to teach us? Things cannot be what we want, when we want, as we want. Other people have ideas and inputs, and why won't they leave Rap Brown alone? The future is ours to take. We're going to Mars because we have the hardware to do it. We have the rockets and the fuel and the money and the stuff. And the only reason NASA is holding back is they don't know if what they send out will be what they get back. So let me slow this down. Mars is one year of travel to get there, plus one year of living on Mars, plus one year to return to Earth, equals three years of Earthlings being in a tight space, going to an unknown place with an unsure welcome awaiting them. Tired muscles, unknown and unusual foods, harsh conditions, and no known landmarks to keep them human. Only a hope and a prayer that they will be shadowed beneath a benign hand, and there is no historical precedent for that except this, the trip to Mars can only be understood through black Americans, I say. 
the trip to Mars can only be understood through black Americans. The people who were captured and enslaved immediately recognized the men who came, who chained and whipped them and herded them into ships so tightly packed there was no room to turn, no privacy to respect, no tears to fall without landing on another. We're not kind and gentle and concerned for the state of their souls, no. The men with whips and chains were understood to be killers, feared to be cannibals, known to be sexual predators. The captured knew they were in trouble in an unknown place without communicable abilities with a violent and capricious species. But they could look out and still see signs of home. They could still smell the sweetness in the air. They could see the clouds floating above the land they loved. But there reached a point when the captured could not only not look back, they had no idea which way back might be. There was nothing in the middle of the deep blue water to indicate which way home might be. And it was that moment when a decision had to be made. Do they continue forward with a resolve to see this thing through, or do they embrace the waters and find another world? In the belly of the ship, a moan was heard, and someone picked up that moan, and a song was raised, and that song would offer comfort and hope and tell the story. When we go to Mars, it's the same thing. It's middle passage. When the rocket red glares, the astronauts will be able to see themselves pull away from Earth. As the ship goes deeper, they will see a sparkle of blue. And then one day, not only will they not see Earth, they won't know which way to look. And that's why NASA needs to call black America. They need to ask us, how did you calm your fears? How were you able to decide you were human, even when everything said you were not? How did you find the comfort in the face of the improbable to make the world you came to your world? How was your soul able to look back and wonder? And we will tell them what to do. To successfully go to Mars and back, you will need a song. Take some Billie Holiday for the sad days and some Charlie Parker for the happy ones, but always keep at least one good spiritual for comfort. You will need a slice or two of meatloaf, and if you can manage it, <laughs> you will, and if you can manage it, some fried chicken in a shoebox with a moist lemon pound cake. A bottle of beer, because no one should go that far without a beer, and maybe a six pack, so that if there is life on Mars, you can share. Popcorn for the celebration when you land, while you wait on your land legs to kick in. And as you climb down the ladder from your spaceship to the Martian surface, look to your left. And there you'll see a smiling community quilting a black-eyed pea watching you descend. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, hold on. Let me... All right. I just love that. Um, yeah. I, I could say so much about that. I could spend 45 minutes talking about that. Um, I feel, you know, it's, it's doing something that I try to do in my work, which is talking about, you know, dreaming of a future, looking to the past, finding connections between the two. It's both like beautiful and tragic. And, you know, it has real information and fantasy. All of these things are the things I look for things like that, you know, that um, they kind of, uh, talk about the world in a different way, right? And also just feel this kinship. Um, when I see some, when I hear something like that, I just feel this like kinship to her as an artist, me as an artist, you know, different forms, but you know, kind of similar mission, uh, love in our hearts, trying to, trying to help out. So um, with that, I'll, I'll start. Um, so the first, um, so, you know, as the introduction said, you know, I went to undergrad, <coughs> at Wake Forest University. And when I went there, um, I went there as a pre-med student and I was on the track team. Uh, and that's how things started. <laughs> and uh, the track thing went away after about a year. I realized, you know, that was not uh, for me, uh, at least at the college level. Um, I do run a lot now, which, you know, we may talk about, but, um, and the, the pre-med thing stuck around for like three years. And then until I took an art class, I took a sculpture class. Uh, in which I started um, making art and having these critiques and I just something like a spark lit in me that hadn't been lit in any of the three years of college before that and high school probably before that um, you know I, I um, and I found a, found my voice and you know I've always felt like sculpture is that place for me where um, things happen, magic things happen um, that are different than other mediums. I don't know, it's just sort of where I started. Um, so I'm gonna start this 
a lecture um, talking about the sculpture that I made that basically changed the trajectory of all the work I would do afterwards. So this is the first black rock negative energy absorber and um, it's 24 feet tall, nine feet wide, um, just to give you some context. Um, it's made out of concrete and up here you see uh, this purple area. So that is probably the size of my head. There's one on this side and then there's one on the other side. Um, the water that you see behind it is the East River here and that's Manhattan. So that would be the east side of Manhattan there. This is in Queens at this place called the Socrates Sculpture Park. Um, boy, I wish I would have... Uh, looked up the date of when I think this is from like 2006 or something like that I made this piece Does that makes sense something like that I think so it doesn't really matter the specific date but um so so the way that this this place works this is called Socrates Sculpture Park and every year they do this open call so if in, any artist living in New York City can propose an art project a sculpture project and then if you get accepted they you have like a several months to make a sculpture you can make it on site and they give you money um to make it and then it's up for six months and so i've been doing lots of sculptures and different things prior to this had been living in new york since 2001 um and you know making a lot of like political artwork um and one of the big criticisms about political art which is probably a great place to start this lecture is that you're not doing anything, right? You're just like kind of preaching to the choir, right? You're just talking about the problem with a bunch of people that probably already agree with you, right? And so like, what's it doing? How's it changing anything, you know? And, and you know, like people don't necessarily come up to me and confront me with this question, but it's something that I always think about and it comes up in different ways, um, in different contexts. Um, and so I decided I was gonna make a sculpture um, that does something. It doesn't just like point to a problem, but it actually does something to fix the problem. So I'm like, I'm gonna make this magic sculpture. And this magic sculpture is gonna pull the negative energy from people so that they can be nice, nicer. And just sort of like, instead of trying to figure out like a solution for racism, sexism, homophobia, you know, um, financial inequities, all of these different things, which are well beyond like sort of, uh, my ability to like fix each one of those problems or even offer solutions, I'm going to use this other force. I'm going to use the spirits. I'm going to use magic. I'm going to use, um, you know, creativity, imagination, things like that. Um, and so I had this crazy idea and I was like, I don't know if anybody is going to like get it, like, you know, um, appreciate it. But um, I was like, I'm just gonna, you know, so I proposed it. They said, yeah, great, do it. That sounds fun. So I made it. And then, you know, when I had the, when the piece was up, this is a picture of it in the winter, um, you know, so here's what happened. Like one of the first things that happened is um, while I was out in the field working on this, like putting the concrete on it, one of the, so this is a New York City park. And so one of the guys was driving around, you know, kind of doing maintenance and stuff. And he asked me, he's like, hey, what is that thing you're making? You know, it's had this big frame up. Um, and I told him, you know, I'm making the Black Rock negative energy absorber. And he said, oh yeah, man, I used to have one of those next to my bed in the seventies, <laughs> you know, like right off the bat makes a joke about it. And I was like, well, if he can make a joke about it, I think he gets the idea, right? It's not like, just like, what? Like, you know, it didn't scramble his brains. It wasn't confusing. Like he got it right away and he got the sense of humor. And, you know, as I talked to people about it and I had it up, people got both the sense of humor, but also like the sentiment, like I really do want to help, you know? And like, maybe magic is the solution. We've tried everything else, you know, um, a la Nikki Giovanni. So, so the piece was up for six months and, um, you know, really, uh, spent a lot of time out there and, you know, we had different events and talked to people about it and, and people seem to sort of resonate with this idea of this magic sculpture, like, you know, maybe this is a good idea. And so, um, but, you know, the world didn't change, right? Like crimes were still happening, actually like a very big story about happened like down the street from the sculpture, uh, which I ended up doing an art piece about and I'll show it to you. So I was like, okay, so like one big sculpture is not gonna be the solution. Like I made it really big, it's like 24 feet tall, it's like as big as a building. So maybe I should make a bunch of small ones and like disperse them all over the world. And maybe in their multiplicity, they'll start to help, you know? And so I started making smaller ones in my studio. And so this is like, 
probably like two feet tall, using paper mache, got the crystals in there, experimenting with other materials. Um, this is another one similar size. And so I just kept making them and thinking about this idea of these sort of magic sculptures. And, you know, I tend to work big. It's just like, I'll start something small and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And so eventually I started making really big ones again. This is probably like my height, like six feet tall. Um, and so I made a bunch of small ones and then I started making this group of large, like six foot tall sculptures. Um, and, you know, really thinking about this idea and, you know, wondering if it made any sense. And, and then one day I was uh, riding the train uh, to my therapist's office or actually on the way back going to my studio. And I saw everybody was reading this newspaper um, and it really caught my eye, right? Uh, you see this guy, this black guy, young guy, looks kind of like me, you know? Um, and it says Fry Baby next to it, you know? And I'm like, what in the hell, you know? And um, so I, I bought one, right? I was like, what is this craziness? What is going on? And like, it somehow it seemed related to these sculptures and this idea of negative energy and darkness. And so the story is, no one can read that. It's all blurred out now in this low res copy of it. But basically, this young man killed these two police officers that are pictured here. And he had gone to court the day before and stuck his tongue out at one of the widows while he was there. And so that's why the New York Post said like, just burn this guy, you know, just kill him. Um, which, you know, like, so, so he did a bad thing, right? He killed these two people. Then he goes to court, he doubles down on it. He sticks his tongue out at the, the widow. But then the Post does this terrible thing and they make this like newspaper which just totally dehumanizes him. I don't think they would have done this now. This is back when I'm talking, you know, like 06. Just so interesting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, I mean, they're known for doing these really ridiculous uh, covers that are really insensitive and just grab your attention, but they even wouldn't do this now. But um, so I was just thinking about the layers of like who's worse, you know, and like, What's the repercussions of this? Like he did a terrible thing, but then them like sort of castigating him has a spillover effect on me and anybody that looks like me, right? It just sort of like villainizes black men. Like it just feeds into that. Um, so I, I knew that this thing was related. And so somehow, but I didn't know what I was gonna do with it. So I just like tacked it up on my wall and I kept making the sculptures and I kept looking at it and kept just like, couldn't let, couldn't let it go. Couldn't stop thinking about it. So eventually I made a painting of it. And so this is like the first um, one of these sort of portrait series that I did. And it really just on a whim based on just running into that uh, newspaper. Uh, this is Ron L. Wilson is his name. And so this is an acrylic painting on panel. The first ones were that uh, made in this sort of format. Um, so I made a painting of him and, you know, and, and, you know, put it up on the wall in the studio and I'm making the sculptures and I'm like, yeah, there's something happening here. These two things are, are talking to each other. They're kind of talking about the same thing in different ways. And so I kept making, uh, so I made more, you know, I start, you know, you start paying attention, you start seeing patterns, right? And so you start seeing other black men accused of crime, sort of castigated by the press. Um, not all great ones, right? Like not all innocent victims, some are more, sort of like, uh, what would I say, sort of like, some are more sort of innocent victims and some are more sort of perpetrators. And I'm having trouble talking about it because it's very complex. And so the language around it, I don't want to just sort of flatten out what I'm saying. I'm really trying to speak to the complexity. So this one I made, actually, this guy is um, a Black president from Sierra Leone that um, was not a good president. This is before Obama. He basically had his political opponents killed by a militia group. So he was in the news. And so I, you know, I was thinking about that. Um, and, and then these guys, these are the guys, this guy, this guy, and this guy um, had stolen the car, got pulled over by the police and were, uh, and ran, like shot the police and escaped and fled. And they were in the news for weeks and weeks and weeks after. And this all happened like, maybe two miles from that sculpture that I told you about, like down the street, literally. So, um, and this guy in particular, you know, what I really started thinking about like right away, and I guess it, you could see it in the first thing is how the media works, right? Like how they report on these stories and like, why do they report on these stories? Um, and one of the things that it made me think about is like, 
one thing I've been thinking about and talking about, and I don't know if it's true, this is just my crazy theory, is that like this country is full of people from all over the world, right? And we all have different beliefs, different religions, all, you know, no religion, all different types of things. So the media, so, so, you know, as a culture, like how do we sort of arbitrate morals, right? How do we tell people what we like, what we don't like? We have our laws, right? That's one thing. But I think the media plays a role in sort of like, um, sort of raising up people that we want to call heroes and tearing down people we want to call villains and sort of shaming people when we don't like what they have to say or what they do. So this guy, one of the three people, the first two people got caught pretty quickly. This guy escaped to Pennsylvania and hid. So he was in the news day after day after day. And eventually he was caught um, and they made a big joke about him because he was overweight and they caught him in a ditch and it was ha 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 we're all to laugh at him. Um, you know, you know, he it's okay to laugh at him, you know, because you know he did this thing and he's overweight or something and you know and it just sort of red flag showed me like wow isn't that interesting how the media works and how it's sort of functioning right now and so i've been like paying attention to that. Um, a lot. So this is a group of young men called the Jenna Six. There were these six high school students that um, there was this thing called like the white tree. This is down in Louisiana. And um, and they, you know, this big racial conflict um, at their school. And they were all like thrown into jail and, you know, ended up in the national press about, you know, how they were mistreated. Um, so so I made paintings of them. Um, and so the first exhibition I had of this work was a combination of these paintings <clears throat> of these people. These Basically, it was Black men that were convicted of crimes, um, but hadn't been sort of gone to court or anything yet. It was very specific, right? It's sort of like how um, even before you go to court or anything and you're proven innocent or guilty, you're sort of the, the media will like basically paint you as guilty and then you're just in everybody's eyes guilty. So with these paintings, of these men and the sculptures, these black rock negative energy absorber sculptures. And I was really thinking about the connections between the two of them. Okay, and so then I show this image because this guy, um, he was called the Second Avenue Slasher was his name in the press. Um, and basically <clears throat> I made a painting of him, you know, he had a mental breakdown and like went into a restaurant and like grabbed a knife and like stabbed somebody and then ran off. And eventually he was caught. He was having a mental uh, breakdown. He had mental illness and, you know. So, um, so he was in jail and um, all of a sudden I'm at home. I have this show and like maybe a month or two later, I start getting this guy sent me this huge packet of papers, uh, legal papers. And so I get this packet of legal papers from him and I kind of like look at it vaguely, but I'm like, oh, I'm too busy. I don't have time to look at this. I threw it in a drawer. And then another couple of weeks go by or like a month or two go by and I get another stack of papers um, from him, legal papers. And I'm like, oh, you know, I really ought to look at this. And I was like debating like, oh, this guy's reaching out. Maybe he's asking me to help him with his case. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. And eventually I get a call from the gallery. They're like, Rudy, this guy is, um, he's accusing you, the New York Times, the Daily News, the Post, the Washington, Time, the Washington Post, of defamation of character. Um, and so he was suing me. Those papers were uh, was legal papers. He was suing me. And so um, luckily the partner of one of the people at the gallery was a lawyer and he was able to sort of plead my case. And basically my press release for the show was my defense. Basically, I was actually doing the opposite of what he was accusing me of. Like I was trying to sort of like have us relook at his story and not just uh, flatten him out to some, you know, evil villainous person. And, and so it was just, it was a really interesting lesson for me, like the things, those press releases you write and you put on the desk at a show that like nobody ever reads are really important. You know what I mean? Like in this case, it sort of got me, uh, it made clear my intentions in this situation, which was, uh, you know, important. Um, and so I, you know, I mean, I did before that, but I definitely from now on, like really think about the stuff that gets written about my work and how make it clear to people like what my um, intentions are. Um, so, you know, the case was dropped and everything was worked out fine. Um, so these are the first two watercolors that I did. Um, uh, I'm not going to tell all the stories of each one because they're all quite harrowing. Um, but basically the guy on the left killed the guy on the right. 
And it was initially thought that it was sort of like they were strangers and that it was sort of racially motivated, which it may have been. But actually, it turns out that they'd been hanging out at a bar. They hung out all the time and knew each other. And um, not that they were friends, but um, but what the reason the thing that caught me about this story that I will share is that um, if you look up James Beard, who's the victim, you get the other guy. And if you look up the other guy's name, you get that guy. And like their names are intertwined. And if you're not careful, you'll think one person is the other. Like the way the internet works is like the victim and the criminal, like they're married together forever. Like if you look up James Beard, you're like, well, is it the white guy or the black guy? Who's James Beard? You know, you really, um, and so I was just really interested in that and like how their fates are now intertwined. You know, um, one person has passed away. One lives the rest of his life. I mean, anyway, in real life, you know, he lives the rest of his life sort of paying for his crime, hope, you know, um, but also within the way that they're remembered. So, um, so I, so this was the start of the watercolors and it was just me continuing to work with this material and these ideas and think about them. And I started thinking about these, these relationships between these two people. And like uh, was mentioned in the introduction, when I show them, I just show them all the same. They're just on the wall all together. They're not sort of like, you can't tell who's the victim, who's the perpetrator. Uh, and because I'm really interested in people looking at the work and not knowing, like just seeing them as people first. And then, um, you know, you can go and look at the little uh, check sheet and see where each person's name and their story and all that. But in between the time when you look them in the eye and when you do that, you know, there's room for them to just be a person again um, before that judgment comes in. And I'm really interested in that gap, so. Um, so this is Sean Bell on the right here um, and one of the police officers that um, killed him on his wedding day. Um, Kiel Coppin, Ted Kaczynski. So this is uh, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Uh, this is him as a high school student. I just looked back and I was like, huh, what was he like as a kid? You know, <laughs> just thinking about him and things and, you know, like really trying to like investigate this idea, like who are these evil people? So this is Zach Zachary Musawi. He was involved in 9-11 and was captured and imprisoned. Um, this is Gabrielle Gifford and um, the guy that shot her. Uh, she survived and then these six victims died in that shooting. Um, so I'm making these, so this, this work has continued, you know, uh, till today, um, just on and on. So these types of stories continue to happen and I continue to sort of, uh, um, you know, investigate them, memorialize the people killed, but also sort of think about the, the perpetrators as well. And, um, think about these ideas of empathy and compassion. Um, and so while I, while I was doing this sort of early days of it, I, um, I went to a friend's studio and he had this book. Um, oh, here it is. This is a cool thing about Zoom is I can show you the book. So this is a book that he had in his studio that I then took and said, this is mine now, <laughs> it's a good friend. Um, so he had this book in his studio. I don't know why he had it, but. Basically, it was portraits of these men in the Taliban. And um, basically what they would do was they would have a portrait taken of themselves before they went off to battle. Like they would go to this specific portrait, these portrait studios. Uh, and so uh, someone made a book basically collecting all these portraits. Um, they're anonymous, like uh, they're, they're from the studios. Um, and it really just like, it's just a book with all the pictures, right? And you're just looking in these people's eyes and just, when I looked through the book, it really made me uh, really think about who these people are, these people in the Taliban, right? Um, and beyond just sort of like, oh, they're these evil people over in Afghanistan and we gotta like, they are, they're responsible for 9-11 and we, you know, and they, you know, we must obliterate them, you know, which is sort of the American party line, at least in the beginning. Um, and so I, you know, I looked at these people and I was like, oh my God, like, who are they? You know, like, what are they fighting for and why are they willing to risk their lives? Um, what, what is the, you know, what is compelling them to risk their lives, like to go off the battle, to die for these beliefs? Like what is, you know, what, what's in it for them, you know? And so it just sort of complicated this, I, this flattened again version of them as just sort of these evil sort of perpetrators over, you know, 
you know, the less you know about somebody, the easier it is to sort of villainize them. Um, and so I just, again, didn't know how it was related per se, but I was just like, all right, I, I need to take this book to my studio. <laughs> and I just started making portraits of them and looking them in the eyes and really thinking about them and who they are. And, you know, I say all this to say like, you know, like, um, this is not in any way to absolve, you know, the way they treat women, which, you know, come you come to find out later um, or anything, you know, um, that they've done, but just to, because I, I think that even if you think like, oh man, they've done some horrible things as a group, you still can't just leave it at that. I think we, I think so often we just leave it there. Like, oh, this group did these, they're responsible for these horrible things. And we're just gonna stop thinking about it there. And we're gonna move on to the next thing. And we don't need to know anything more about it. Like I guess have taken on this sort of challenge of like, well, can I learn more about it? Can I think more about it than that? And like, what comes of that, you know? Um, and so that's what I'm doing. And that's what I'm sort of presenting and then asking the viewer to do, which um, I'm always sort of, um, you know, as I talk about it, I get nervous because I'm like always like, at what point are people gonna just like turn on me and be like, no, you can't make a painting of that person, which happens sometimes on the internet. People are like, what are you doing? You can't make a painting of that person. Um, so um, I'm used to it, but I also am very thoughtful about what I'm doing and careful. Um, so that was a whole series of portraits that I did. I just showed you a few of them. Um, and then I started making, started thinking about, um, you know, just a different way of presenting things. So, you know, um, Hurricane Katrina happens and, you know, it just sort of upends everything and really you know, the way it was handled and, you know, all of this stuff, I was like, I mean, I want to make work about this, you know, and I don't know if people remember, this is a painting of Kanye West, uh, who said at the time, you know, George people does, George Bush doesn't care about black people, um, which was like the most profound thing that was said the whole time, right? It just cut right to the point, you know, like the way people were left there to fend for themselves for so long, you know, and so I made a painting of the Superdome, which is a sort of symbol of, you know, where the, where their football team plays and it was destroyed, you know, and as I saw that I found this picture of it and I was like, oh my God, this just says, has so many layers of meaning to it. So I made a painting of that. I made a painting of him and I painted a painting of this other portrait of this young girl that was like 14 that had drowned. Um, I'll move by it quickly. Um, and I present them all together as sort of like a way of telling that story, right? Between the the three pieces. So it was something I was experimenting with. It's just like other ways of telling stories other than just these like one portrait of one person. Cause there's certain things as I go along, you'll see that just can't be, um, stories that can't be told that way. It just doesn't make any sense. So just thinking of other ways to, um, you know, so, so then I'm not limited to, you know, certain topics. So another thing that's going on, you know, I mentioned that, you know, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, so, um, so Osama bin Laden goes missing, right? He's sort of like the mastermind of 9-11 and all this, and he's hiding for years. I don't know, what was it, like 10 years or something? Long time. So finally, this picture comes out of him. One picture comes out, right? And this is the picture that, they, they, that the press uh, presented, or the White House presented. And it's a picture of him watching himself on TV in this like crappy room with all these wires everywhere. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. They didn't find like a nice picture of him sitting with his family or looking powerful or talking to his people. They find this picture of him watching himself on TV in like a college dorm, you know, this kind of crappy room. And I'm like, I bet that was a, uh, a specific choice that they made. I'm sure they had other pictures. <laughs> and so I was like, I want to make a painting of that. I want to mark this moment. And then eventually they find him, you know, and this is the image that they um, came out um, of the compound where he was hiding in Pakistan, if I'm not for mistaken. Um, so this is a painting of that. Um, they later made a movie about this called Zero Dark Thirty, where they like go into it, which was crazy to see after I made this painting, because I was like, I know this place inside and out. Um, so this is again, a way of like talking about, there's another painting that goes with it that I'm gonna show you, but this is a way of talking about this story of, them finding Osama bin Laden and, and um, eventually killing him is what happened. So um, this is um, called the Situation Room or the War Room, this paint, this image. Uh, this is Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, 
Joe Biden, now our president. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and lots of other people that were in the room. So this is a, a, an image that came out. Um, this is what the, this is them in the room watching the attack happen. Um, and I wanted to make a painting of this because I thought it was just so interesting. Like everybody's body language is just like speaks just so much, right? So, so there was a lot of talk made of Hillary uh, covering her mouth, like being a gas, like being human, being like, oh my God, this is terrible. Like, I don't know why that was a problem, but you know, she's not supposed to do that or something, right? And so that was like one thing that talked about, but Obama, like it came out a little weird here because you know, through in the translation, but Obama was like sitting in the chair, sort of like shrugging, like he didn't want to be there, right? He was just like, oh, this is awful. Um, and this guy's just like typing away, like fire, fire, go get him, you know, <laughs> just sort of like doing his job there. And then this, there was a photograph sitting here or something that was redacted. And so I tried to reproduce that as it was redacted and that was also redacted. Um, so this was sort of like trying to capture that moment and all the sort of drama and interplay. Um, and, you know, it's specific to like a moment that happened but also symbolic, uh, which I always think these things are. Um, they're both, um, you know, I kind of think of them as like history painting or something like contemporary history painting. Um, so trying to capture the moment and it's about the specific moment, but it also speaks to our culture and the way things happen in it. Um, this is an image I found on the cover of the New York Times um, of the Libyan rebels, come of these guys coming out of this tank. Um, so then after doing this work for a while, I, um, you know, I'm making the sculptures, I'm making these portraits and these paintings. I, I wanted to uh, find a way to kind of activate this idea of this um, black rock negative energy absorber, like these sculptures, like up to that point, they were like these like objects, like these inert objects that couldn't do anything. They couldn't move, they couldn't talk, they didn't make any noise. And like, man, I want these things to get up and move around. And so I created this character called the healer. Um, and so I made this sort of head, which is sort of like one of the sculptures and then, you know, the rest of the sort of costume. And the first thing I did was just made a bunch of videos. Like I'm literally, there's like 200 videos of this character, the healer all over the world, whether it be in my apartment or in New York or out in the woods in Pennsylvania, in my office, you know, I've been out in the desert in Arizona with my dad and my kids and, you know, all over the, you know, world. No, I don't know if I've left the country uh, as the character, but so, and, and I've been just like shooting video of this and other interstitial stuff. Um, and I made this sort of video that's sort of non-linear, um video i don't know what's next okay cool let me finish talking about this and the way that i present it is usually like multiple projections and i have a computer that basically i have all the videos on a hard drive and a computer just picks at random and it just plays them at random and so it's not a linear movie that goes you know from beginning to end because it's not the way it was intended and it's so it's just played on multiple channels and it, and it goes randomly sometimes you'll see the same scene on two different screens uh and things like that happen or bird flies by you know there's a lot of serendipity that happens which i'm really interested in um and i also started making these small ceramic versions of them these are called healing devices um still thinking about this idea of healing but i was trying to start to kind of shift the scale to something you would like thinking of tools like things you would interact with and like use or you know so they sort of suggest some kind of function. Am I supposed to pick it up? Am I supposed to blow in it? Am I using it for something? Like, you know, sort of kind of resemble um, objects from our everyday life and their scale. Um, and so that leads me to um, another public art project that I did. So I was invited to make another one of the large sculptures um, outdoors. Uh, this is a sort of a uh, Goodness, what am I trying to say? A sort of drawing of it, digital drawing that I made of it, a proposal, that's what I'm trying to say, of the piece. Uh, this was sort of the idea. I'm, I'm gonna walk you through, I know there's students here. Um, so I just wanna kind of walk through how they're made. So this is in Manhattan, that's Houston Street. So Soho, no, no, no. Soho's to the right over here. This is the Lower East Side on the other side of the street. Uh, so this is kind of how they start. They have a, you know, I make like a wood frame. I kind of work. I had a drawing, but I kind of work intuitively and I just sort of make it um, 
um, make it sturdy, but also kind of like find the form as I'm going along. It's a similar way to work with other things. And then I cover it in metal lath. And then I start putting on concrete. So it's actually, it looks, it's meant to look like it's solid, but it's actually hollow. And so the first coat goes on like that. And then the second coat has the dye in it. Um, and so this is us working on it. And there's a finished piece here. Um, so when it's first finished, it looks like perfect. And then as the water, the lime and it kind of comes bleeding through, it kind of looks more natural. Um, so, um, so at this point, I've got this character that I made, the, the um, oh my God, the healer. Um, and I've got these sculptures and now, right? And so I was like, oh, maybe this is an opportunity now I could bring the healer into the real world. I'd never done a performance with them before this. And so I was like, oh, I'm gonna bring the healer in and he's gonna actually like turn on the sculpture. Um, so that was my idea. I was gonna have this like ceremony. And, um, and so what I did is I have a friend that's a musician. So I invited him to provide some music um, to set the scene. And I kind of just gave him the idea of, you know, this is going to be this healing ceremony. We're going to turn on the sculpture. I mean, and I worked out some like hand signals, you know, we're going to kind of take the tone up and bring it down and things like that. And then I had this friend that is a, um, these are the guys that helped me um, build the sculpture. Um, guy I went to grad school with, Matthew Lusk. And this guy, Stefano, uh, was in town from Italy for the summer. Um, he's an architect and he was just like, I, our kids played Little League together. And I literally was like, hey, can you wanna help me make a sculpture? And he's like, sure, I'm not doing anything. I'm just hanging out in New York for the summer. So he spent two weeks with me making the sculpture. Back to what I was saying. So the healing ceremony. So we invite everybody here. This is my friend, Ian Mayer. He is an artist, but he's also a Unitarian minister. And he's also hilarious. So I, so I had him sort of open up the ceremony um, and I had him talk about this idea, you know, that we talked about at the very beginning. I mean, you know, the world is so troubled and we need love, we need the healing, we need the healer is gonna come, he's gonna turn the sculpture on, the sculpture is gonna to heal us, you know? And so he's got sage, he's buried in sage. I don't know what he said, I'm, I'm somewhere off, you know, getting ready. But by the time I come out to do my performance, the crowd is chanting, we need love. He's got them all ch chanting. And I come out as the healer um, and I do this performance, which is all improvised, both the music and my movements. And I sort of quote unquote, my, my prompt is that I'm going to activate the sculpture. I'm gonna turn it on. I'm gonna embody that for the viewers. And so that's what I do. And so here's some shots of, some still shots of that experience. The performance the first one just sort of naturally ended with me climbing up to the top and um you know i don't know just felt compelled to do it so i did it uh with a mask on not really being able to see but uh it was fine i sort of stumbled around and, and, and made it up there everybody takes their phones out and takes pictures and then i come out and i disappear um so these jumps all feel very abrupt, but it's kind of how it goes. So I'm making these portraits of people, you know, and, you know, Trayvon Martin is uh, killed and, you know, I make a painting of him. And then, you know, there's all this talk about what he was wearing when he, uh, when he was out there, he's wearing this black hoodie and that's a problem. And he looked like a criminal. And, you know, there's all this sort of blaming him for what happened to him. Um, and then, um, so I made a picture with him with the black hoodie. I made a picture of him with his fingers up. I made a picture of him looking like an innocent child. Like I just kept, I couldn't stop thinking about him in the story and all that it's sort of, all the implications of the way it was being presented. And then one day I looked and I saw this painting of him, this picture of him with his dad. And I just was, you know, that, that hit me, you know, that moved me to tears. I was like, you know, I can relate to being him I can relate to being the dad, you know, cause I have my own kids. And so I just was like, I've already made three paintings of him, like these watercolors, but I need to make a painting of this because this tells the story in a way that I want to tell it, you know, that this is just a kid. He was what, 16, 17. This is somebody's son, you know, that's who was killed here. That's who we're talking about. And so I made a painting of him with his dad in their house. And then after I did that, I was like, you know what? Like, I'm not done. I'm still not done. And so I ended up making a, 
reshooting the photograph with me and my son in my apartment and making a painting of us together. And so now they they um, they they exist together as like a diptych. These two paintings, this set of paintings. Um, and so this is just uh, an installation shot to kind of show you what these shows look like with all these portraits. Um, so this is a um, show I had at Mixed Screens Gallery, you know, so you see everything from like, uh, let's see here, Mario Balotelli, famous soccer player that's sort of always villainized. Um, this is me with a black hoodie on, like the one, the portrait of Trayvon Martin. This is Michael Brown. This is a news reporter that was killed um, by the Al Qaeda. Um, let's see, there's my dad sleeping at the beach. Um, there's, a port there's my Angelo, there's Trayvon Martin, there's Lil Wayne, there's um, another portrait of Trayvon Martin with the fingers up. Um, there's the kid that was re the responsible for the, um, Boston Marathon bombing and a, a portrait of his father is next to him. There's Bradley Manning. There's, um, damn, I can't think of Bradley Manning's name now. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, all mixed together. Sterling, Donald Sterling, racist NBA owner. I think he's still an NBA owner. Um, everybody's mixed together. You don't know the criminals from the victims, from the, you know, people I'm, you know, Pete Seeger, everybody's up there together. And in order to find out who's who and who you're supposed to like and who you're not supposed to like, you read through the checklist, you know? And so before you do that, you just see them all as people. And Mary Baraka, another poet um, who passed away around that time. Um, so, so by this point, maybe I should mention too, I'm not only, doing sort of stories that relate to crime, but also sort of um, honoring people. Generally, if someone passes away, that is like, a, you know, someone uh, of importance, that's not the what I wanna say, but like someone that, um, I don't know, that I see as sort of like having con contributed something or being important, like Robin Williams had passed away, committed suicide, you know, uh, struggled with um, mental health and drug problems his whole life, you know, felt a connection to that. Amir Baraka, Black poet, um, you know, different Maya Angelou, she taught at Wake Forest when I was there, great poet, you know, uh, writer. Uh, contributed to the world in a way I would only hope to, you know, things like that. I'm making portraits of, of those people and putting those in there as part of the story as well. And so they kind of end up being a little bit of like the story of the last two years, right? You see this, you recognize these people, you know, you recognize these stories. Um, so I'm going to move along. I know it's sort of, here's a close-up shot of some people. Um, Nelson Mandela passed away. Um, so then, um, you know, the church shooting happened. Uh, this is Dylan Roof, um, who was on trial recently. And then these are the, some of the victims of that shooting, the guy that, young man, that went into the church and shot up the black church. Uh, this is the, um, minister, Pinckney, uh, who was a state senator. And these are some of the other victims, people that were there, Michael Brown, um, again, I'm not going to go into all those stories, but, you know, Terrence Crutcher, um, damn, sometimes I forget people's names too, so that doesn't help. Um, and then, so, so this is a little bit of a sidebar, but like, I'm obsessed with cult leaders. Um, and if you just go with me for a minute, <laughs> they've been in two shows already. And the reason that I'm obsessed with them and like the movies about them always sort of like start the same way, right? They start this like utopian sort of religious sort of community. Like let's take Jim Jones, that's him there, right? He starts this church in, in San Francisco and it's like multiracial and everybody's like singing and loving and they're all, everything's going really well. Then they move to the inlands in California. They start a farm, they're growing their own food. They're living together, everything's cool. Then he starts sleeping with everybody. Then he starts becoming an egomaniac and thinks the government's out to kill him. Then they move to Cuba. <coughs> and then he flips out and says, oh, you know, they're all trying to kill us and we all have to, you know, they all start like kind of like this utopian, amazing, like beautiful thing. And then they all end up like these leaders, like, like whatever psychosis or sort of 
narcissistic thing they have in them like sort of turns the whole thing around and makes it like uh you know the opposite of any kind of utopia right so so it's like they offer an escape from this world that i've been talking about and then that escape sort of like because they're human and you know very uh fallible it always like collapses and becomes worse so you know this is father yod he had a call in the 70s in california and they had a rock band they made really good music they're called the source family um but yeah didn't end well either uh not as bad as that though um but again i'll keep moving um so these are more of the large paintings kind of telling stories so that's the um one summer, the Malaysian, two Malaysian airplanes disappeared. So I made a huge painting that's probably like seven feet long, a uh, watercolor of that. Um, these are the kids that were killed by the Syrian gas attack. Another image that just struck me to tears when I saw it. Um, I'll move quickly because I know these things are triggering. This was a typhoon in the Philippines. I know lots of friends from the Philippines. And so I felt connected to that uh, Malaysian airline. And then this was um, these uh, women from Syria who were a portrait that was taken of them. They were mourning the death of somebody. Um, and so then this is again, like that idea of history painting where there is a specific painting of these specific people, but it's also symbolic, right? They're mourning for all of us. They're mourning for all these people, you know? And so I sort of think of it that way, if that's possible, Alan Curdy. Um, so these are more of the healing devices. Um, sometimes they sort of turn into this invention of characters, uh, the healer, different things happen or I'm just finding form, thinking about function, fictional function. This one's called black and blue. Um, so just showing you a variety of those. And then this is the project that I did uh, we were talking about the very beginning at the Three River Arts Festival, this um, Black Rock negative energy absorber that I did there in downtown Pittsburgh. So this is a sculpture and these are some shots from the induction ceremony, which is what I call the performance. Um, so Ian had a friend that lived in Pittsburgh. So we got his friend who was also a Unitarian minister to get to start us off. Uh, he wasn't as funny as Ian, but he did a good job. He was a sweet guy. Um, and then this is some shots that um, a photographer gave me uh, of the days that followed. People were meditating next to it, doing yoga. Like it really got, people got the vibe of it there in Pittsburgh. It was part of this big festival too, which I think helped, brought people there to see it. Um, but I just love this image. It looks just people like taking the idea and continuing with it. This is a performance that I did. So I've been doing the performances. At first it started with like connected to the sculptures and now I do them in lots of different types of scenarios. So this is at PS1 during the art book fair one year. Um, so it was just me and my friend Elia who does most of the performances and friend Christoph and no sculpture, no images, just sound and, and performance. This is at Penn State. Um, this is Brian Alfred, he's a painter. Uh, he teaches at Penn State with me um, and he's also plays music and Dan violinist. Um, so we're performing an induction. And then this is in Harlem. Uh, the Studio, and Studio Museum in Harlem invited me to, to make a sculpture. And they said, you can make it in Harlem wherever you want. And so I picked this park next to where I used to live and take my kids. Um, so um, yeah, let me tell a personal story. It's a little probably inappropriate and I don't even have to say it, but there's a real specific reason why I picked this park. So when I split up with my wife at the time, my first wife, I moved to an apartment around the corner in Harlem and I would take my kids to this park and it was a very sad time in my life. It was like, you know, so whenever I go by that park, it's kind of just sad, you know, it kind of reminds me of like, oh man, that like year of just, ugh. so, you know, like they're like, you can make this sculpture wherever you want. It's like, you know what? I want to put it in this park and I want to transform this park, like for me, but also like, it's like a little quiet part of Harlem. It's just like, there's nothing happening over there. It's just very residential. Um, you know, a lot of people that just live in the neighborhood just come there, walk their dogs, you know? And I was like, I wanna put it in just like, not in the middle of flashy 125th street. I wanna put it where I know where the people live. Um, and so I put it there for those multiple reasons. And the other reason I put it there is because it has this amazing bandstand that I'm about to show you. So this is the sculpture and me, uh, these are shots from the performance. Um, 
the induction ceremony. Um, oh, yeah, this will work. So I'm going to play another video and we'll see if the sound works. Uh, just a little tiny short clip of just sort of like the peak moment of the performance, just to give you a little bit of a taste of, of what that's like. Very short. Okay. Oh, that's weird. Oh, it's in there twice. Okay, so this is some still. So this is all the different musicians there up on this band show. And this is like my whole setup, which I just sort of destroyed at the end. Um, some shots from the performance. So you saw 19 seconds of like a 45 minutes performance. So that's sort of like this sort of crazy moment um, of it. So another thing I started doing, and this is I'm going to move quickly, but I saw this movie called The Holy Mountain. Um, that's this is a scene from it. This is Alejandro Jodorowsky, the filmmaker, plays two characters in the movie. It's a portrait of him. Um, it's a movie from the 70s. And I in the movie, he says they're all around the world. There are these holy mountains and you must go to them. Like he just like looks at this. He just looks at the uh, camera and says that. And by the time. I'm sitting here watching this movie in my house. I've been running, all the, doing all this trail running, running through the mountains, like long distance, 100 mile races, 50 mile races. I'm making all these healing sculptures. I've been watching these kind of movies all my life. So when he looked at me and he said, all over the world, there are these holy mountains and you must go to him. I was like, he's talking to me. He's talking specifically to me right now. Like it just like perfectly just fit. I don't know if you can see it or make the connection, but it just fit with all these magic sculptures and this quest for healing and, and all this stuff. And so I just became like obsessed with holy mountains and I started making paintings of them as a way to kind of start taking notes and thinking about it. So these are little small ones with some of the healing devices. And then I started making bigger ones. So this is like, like five feet by three feet or something like that, these paintings. Um, and then I started going to them. So this is Mount Shasta, which is in uh, California. And I actually took this photograph uh, and made this painting of it after I started going to them. There's some of them in the US. This is uh, Mount Everest, which is a holy mountain. This is Devil's Tower uh, or called Bear's Lodge by Native Americans. This is another one of the ones we went to um, on our trip. This is Machu Picchu, Peru, and Mount Fuji in Japan. Uh, and then there's Donald Trump. So last few images I'm going to show you back to the sort of portrait series. Donald Trump becomes president. Everybody freaks out, including myself. Um, at his inauguration, uh, protesters burn one of the limousines. Um, they're called the Black Block, the people that wear all black. This are they, they burn one of the limousines of the people going to the um, inauguration. And I saw the photograph of it and I was like, this is perfect speaks to the sort of rage and fury and frustration that literally did happen. And it also is symbolic of like how we're all feeling and just, uh, and so made a painting of it. Um, Heather Heyer, who was killed in this incident, another one of these photographs that I saw that was even crazier than I would have imagined when I heard the story. This is a, a car driving into the crowd of people in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, and you know, I made this painting, it's very large, because I think people, like, if you're like me, I usually listen to NPR and that's how I hear the news. And so I don't see these images, I don't watch the videos and things like that. And so when I saw this, uh, you know, people flying through the air, it's like, oh my God, you know, this is insane. You know, it like just sort of brought it to life for me. And so I felt like I wanted to show that. And I also really love how there's all these people with all these different, from all these different groups and all their signs are there, um, like Antifa and Solidarity and all the different groups have their, their signs, Black Lives Matter, all this stuff. There's all this information there uh, that's happening, that's telling the story. Um, and then this is a show that I had at Smack Mountain that brings all this work together, which to me is all of a quilt, right? It's sort of talking about this idea of healing and also the troubles of the world and uh, how that all that stuff is related. So this is the show. Um, they had this giant wall too. And so I could take all the portraits that I, that I had made and put them up. 
which I'd never done before. There was, there was like 400 at that point. There's even more now. Uh, I made a, one of the sculptures. So this is just some shots of that. Um, right, thinking about, so, so to me, the, the mountains, the portraits, all of these things are related. Um, you know, they're all speaking about this world that we're in and what are we gonna do about it and how can we help? And, you know, so this is the protest in Paris, the yellow vest movement, they called it. Um, George Floyd, reminiscent of Eric Garner, unfortunately. Uh, this is Amud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks, uh, Elijah McClain. This is the Wendy's that they burned down a summer where um, Rayshard Brooks was killed sitting out in front of it. This is a police station they burned down in Minneapolis after they killed George Floyd. This is the protesters um, stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, John Lewis, portrait of him after he passed away. Ruth Bader Ginsburg also passed away. And then these are two paintings I made this uh, in this year that just for my own damn sanity, you know, like some, some, some hope. This is Alice Coltrane. She was married to John Coltrane, a jazz musician. She's a jazz musician. Uh, she's also was also a very spiritual person. She was a uh, she started an ashram in California. So this is a portrait of her with the people that are in her were in her community um, there in California. And this is Sun Ra. This is a very recent painting that I made of him. He's a jazz musician, spiritualist, filmmaker, artist. Uh, and this is his orchestra, Marshall Allen and June Carter and John Gilmore. And I think that might be, yep, that's the last image that I'm gonna share. All right, so I'll stop there. Should I stop sharing my screen for this next part? Probably, right? I can't see if somebody said. Yeah, that. yeah, I think, I, I think okay, that, so we can all that see makes other. sense, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's my website. Okay, cool. All right. So, so that was a lot of information. You. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it was a lot of information. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, folks have a lot of questions for you, but um, we've collaborated with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion to arrange this amazing student panel. Uh, and they have questions for you. And so they're gonna kind of help us start off this, uh, you know, question session. But I, I'm really glad that the students are um, starting this off because I, I think that, um, you know, so much of this is relevant to, uh, you know, what they're, what they're about to do, what they're doing currently with their studies, what they're gonna do when they graduate, um, things that are going on in their studios. So um, I'm, I'm really excited for this uh, conversation to begin, but I, I just wanna introduce um, the students. Uh, so Cheyenne Baker is a senior in the HEOP program and is a double major in history and sociology graduating this spring. She also serves as a resident assistant for the Multicultural House on the Troy campus, is the president of the Black and Latinx Student Alliance and serves on the advocacy subcommittee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force here at Russell Sage. Jadina Cognetta Whitfield is from Schenectady, New York, and is a sophomore in the Art and Extended Media BFA program. Fun to her is reading, writing, and making art. Her work dissects the layers of the Black experience through collages that evoke new narratives and a sense of euphoria. Ayana Dunn is a senior in the Criminal Justice, Law, and Behavioral Science program graduating this spring. She has recently completed an internship with the New York State Assembly, which has turned into a full-time position, which she holds currently. Ayana intends to start law school in fall 2021. So welcome students and uh, let the conversation begin. Hi, um, I guess I'll, I'll go first. Um, okay. 
I'm Jadiana, but everybody calls me JD. Um, I just want to say um, very grateful and appreciative that you're here and you're, you know, you're spending this time with us. Um, a lot of your work was very moving to me because I, I felt a connection with it just because we talked about similar topics within our work. Yeah. Um, and I have a question, or well, I guess it's like a two-part question that um, I think really resonates with what I'm going through right now as an artist in college and stuff. So I'll just go ahead and ask it. Um, as in black, as in black artists in an art world that I would say is predominantly white, did you ever come across times where you question whether or not you or your work was valid enough, or if you were choosing the right path due to the lack of representation? If so, how did your work pass? How did your work? Uh, Wait, wait, how did you work to push through those doubts? And what are some ideologies or reminders that you may have thought of to keep you going? Right. That's a great question. Um, and it's definitely uh, real for me, definitely something that I've experienced. Um, I, I guess the first thing that, that comes to mind is that, so I went to grad school in Chicago at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and, I had a great time there. It was a great program, met a lot of great people, had a good time. Um, but when it came time to sort of like finish up my time there and figure out where I was going next, uh, this issue came up, right? I, I started looking around at the galleries that were there. There weren't that many, you know, at that time, there'd been a big, um, a lot of galleries had left or whatever, but there weren't that many and there were not, there were not very many, um, showing African-American artists. And so I said, you know, like, I don't think I can stay here. I don't think this is a viable um, possibility as much as I love it here, it's cheaper, I'm all set up. I know people like I have to go somewhere else where I feel like I'm gonna have more opportunities, right? And so I came to New York City. I mean, I wanted to anyway, it's a great city, but part of it is like, there are other African-American artists here. There are galleries that show people of color, whether they're African-American or some other, um, and so that's why I came here, right? Because of, right, just because of what you're talking about. I couldn't just go anywhere. I couldn't go back to DC. Uh, there wasn't enough going on. And of what there was going on, I wasn't gonna, you know, find a lot of community or a lot of opportunity. So I came to New York and, you know, what I found was um, other artists of color um, working on similar ideas, the way you're connecting to me. And when I hear about your work, I'm connecting to you. I, found, I met other people doing, uh, similar work. I also met curators, writers, you know, musicians, people thinking about the same thing. And I, you know, made community with them. I share my work with them. And, you know, it's like, you don't have to tell, explain as much of what your work's about to people that have been thinking about the same thing, you know, I've had studio with visits with people that have read like all the different things that I have and, you know, all the political stuff and they're up on it. And the conversations we have are just, you know, we just go up from all the things we've and other studio visits where, you know, someone really isn't, doesn't have that background and, you know, you're explaining things and, oh, you don't know who Marcus Garvey is. All right, let me break that, you know, <laughs> oh, you don't know who, you know, this part, you know, you have to like, you know, you're, you're doing all this work and you, you just know there's no connection happening, you know? And so, yeah, where I live, where I've been successful uh, to the extent that I have is because, you know, it's shaped by what you're talking about, you know? And, and even there have definitely been times um, when I was making this work and everybody else was doing something else, right? That's not what was like hot or hip, you know what I mean? Well, most of the time I've been doing this, there's been other shit going on that's on the cover of, you know, Art Forum and I'm over here, you know, talking about race and identity and, and you know, the nature of evil. And like, people are like, it's party time, you know, it's 08, it's 2006, we're like all blinged out and having fun. We don't want to think about, you know, the sad state of the world, right? And like, I just keep working and the people that connect to that are the ones that give me shows that invite me to speak. Um, you know, I'm having a weird experience now, like this summer, everything changed, right? All the stuff that happened made what I'm talking about, everybody wants to hear what I have to say at the moment, or, you know, me and people talking about this stuff, all of a sudden, we're very relevant, you know, and so, you know, I'm not going to like, go hide in a hole and say, screw them, they ignored me all this other time, I'm going to get out there and talk about it and show my work. And, you know, I've been on TV, and, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff, and done a bunch of talks and been in the paper and you know that's just how this stuff works and then you know like 
once a pandemic goes is over and money gets yeah, we'll be partying again and abstract painting and you know whatever like we'll you know it'll be something else and you know and I'll just keep doing my work you know and I guess to get to the point of saying all that is like you just have to like believe in what you're doing and it's important like generally I don't know that I could do anything else right it's not like I have a choice that I could just like change topics and just like oh the trend is this I'm just gonna go do that like I'm not really that would be weird and I wouldn't do it well and it would be really disingenuous so it's like whatever you JD and other artists is like whatever you're doing keep doing that if that's what you believe in if that's how you're expressing yourself and whatever kind of success you get is just it's all cyclical so, so it'll come around to you know abstraction will come around again this will come around again you, you know like technology whatever you know like it, but but I think that um, and also like, you know, find your community, right? You don't want to be out there on your own, you know, like reinventing the wheel, like just fighting the fight all by yourself, like find people. And it's, I feel like it's easier now with social media and stuff to find people that are making work that you resonate with and connect with them. And, you know, hopefully more in person as we get out of these bubbles and stuff, you know, and go to, you know, what I found and I would recommend is like if you keep an eye on things and if you see like an artist that you like is having a show go to the opening like I you know you're in New York like you can come down go to the opening and then you're going to see all who you know who's going to show up all the other people like you that like that work you know and then you were like, like that's how I met people I was like oh my god you know you go to like Chris Ophelia's opening and you're like oh here's all the black artists there they are and you know you go to another opening and there they are again and you start meeting them and it's so I'm talking about what, you know, my path, but I, you know, I'd say that for anybody, right? If there's some painter you love, like go to their opening, right? You're going to meet them. You're going to meet the people that resonate with that stuff. So yeah, that's what's so great about places in like New York uh, in particular. There's so many things going on and places to connect, but long answer to a short question. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, already... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. Nope, did you wanna go, whoever that was? It's fine, you can go, sorry. Alrighty, um, so thank you again for coming. Um, I appreciate you sharing your talent and vision with us. Um, so my first question was, how has growing up or your life experiences in general um, contributed to your work and your understanding of different like social issues, for example, like racial injustice and its effects on society. Right. Um, whew, that's a big, big question. But, um, you know, as a African-American male, right, I've had a certain experience of the world, right? And um, that shaped my vision, right? Like I see, I can't help but sort of see things as they relate to me and people of color. Um, I'm aware that like my parents and my sister are here. So I hope they don't mind me talking about like our family, you know, like, so my dad's from Brooklyn, my mom's from Baltimore, right? Like they moved me, we moved to the suburbs, blah, blah, blah. But all my family is, you know, uh, from these places. And so I have my own experiences of, you know, dealing with the police, dealing with the world, having racism affect me sometimes like I went to school in North Carolina I've had people literally like yell out the yell out the window nigger go home and stuff like that right like I've had like overt stuff and I've had the not overt like didn't get this job didn't get invited to this you know what I mean like and you know I've had family members get thrown in jail I had a, you know a family member you know killed by the police uh, that was having a mental health breakdown like a lot of the things like I make work about like I've experienced personally or you know via you know like had happened to my family um, but even if it didn't happen to a family member like it's just like I can just empathize like oh my god you know like what happened to George Floyd like oh my god you know like I can empathize with like that doesn't have to have happened to somebody I specifically know for me to feel like terrible about it and I think a lot of people had that reaction to it right so it's both like there's these things that uh i've personally experienced and like a perspective that i have just because of being a brown person in the mail and you know all these sort of identifiers that i'm looking out of these eyes and people are looking at me with certain expectations that have shaped my worldview, you know and then what i end up saying and then there's just sort of the human inside of me that's just sort of also just in the world and 
seeing things and oh that's terrible you know what I mean and, and stuff like that you know um yeah I want to share one other thing and you didn't even well it relates to your question which is that and this is kind of weird I don't think my kids are on here <laughs> so I'll share but I have a, a kid that um man this is weird I really shouldn't say it but I love to say things I shouldn't say so I had a kid that was like uh transgender and it's weird to, it's only weird because I'm saying it in the past tense like they were transgender for several years like sort of struggled with their sort of gender identity and so that was something as much as I'm like woke and all that and I have friends that are queer and all that like pulled me into that and like understanding that issue and all around it and how people are perceiving that and and what it means you know like feeling like oh my god i have to protect this person from the world it, it just like pulled me in it was just a very clear thing where it's like i you know of course want to be on the right side of this but i hadn't really had to really think about it as much as now i have to now that i have my child is you know dealing with this and you know like do we get the hormone therapy do we do this do we do that and you know and so just I feel like that's a very big one, but there have been other smaller experiences where it's like, as soon as you know somebody going through something, you understand the world in like a really different way, right? And and when you have you're not having those experiences, you really, I'm just learning. It's like, oh, I don't know what it's like. Say to like, oh, I don't want to say that, but um, you know, I don't know what certain things are like until I go through it, or you know, and so it's like the judgment. I have to be very careful with my judgment when it's like things are happening that I haven't experienced. So relates to what you're talking about but yeah thank you yeah. ayana did you have a question that you wanted to ask yes um my question is that um so you have been creating a lot of artwork for a very long time i wanted to know what were some things that you do to avoid burnout um so uh, um, I think that what I do is to um, always have room for like experimentation and to just try something, you know what I mean? Like I don't make a lot of rules, like I do this and I don't do that, you know? Like I have 10, like I have these like projects that are um, continue, right? So like this portrait thing I've been doing for like 14 years. But I'm not doing it because I feel like I have to. I'm doing it because like things keep happening and I want to do it, right? But I also just like, oh, there's, I watch a movie and I hear about these holy mountains and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna do that. And I don't know how it's related that I just do it. You know, like I, I try to keep um, just room for me to just sort of do what I feel inspired to do. And so that way I don't feel like I'm going in and I'm doing the same thing over and over, you know? Um, I was watching this Instagram video the other day and I was like, this guy was like making this figure, like a sculpture of a figure. And I'm like, that's what I'm doing this summer. You know, <laughs> like, I don't do that. As you can see, you did not see any sculptures of people, but that's what I'm gonna try to do this summer. And I don't know how I'm gonna do it. I don't know, like, my mind is just like, don't do that. You don't know how to do that. Like, what are you gonna do with the head? Where, how are you gonna make the hands? And this is like, I don't fucking know. When May comes, if I don't want to do it, I just won't do it. But I really want to do it. When I was watching this guy, it looked like a lot of fun and I could see how it'd be really interesting. So I just, that's how, you know, like I see something, I get inspired. Like I'm an artist, I can do whatever the hell I want. I'm just going to try it, you know? And if it doesn't work out, whatever, throw it in the trash. Don't tell anybody about it, but that's, that's what I would, you know, how I keep it interesting and keep it from becoming too, you know, repetitive or like some kind of weird job. Yeah. I don't have a question, but I just wanted to, to say thank you uh, for being here. And um, uh, you're like Rocky, who is, you know, got something in the closet, that, or sorry, something in the basement, you know, you still got something in the basement, you still have something that's, that you have to test out, you know, right. I like that you, you hung something up, you know, tacked the uh, newspaper on the on the board and you, you knew you were going to do something with it because it affected you. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that's where I am in, in yeah, I'm a I'm first semester. So um, going back, because I knew I had something in the basement from years back, like, you know, right. close to 30 years back. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, you know, back mm -hmm. I just knew that there was something in the basement for me too, but I, I really I enjoyed hearing that part of your, your, your talk about um, always keeping ideas fresh and just 
knowing that there's something out there and just going after it constantly. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, Emily, you had a question. Are you are you still around? I can't find myself. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, hi, I'm Emily Sullivan. Uh, first of all, your speech was amazing and it was super inspiring. I really like the idea of the black rock sculpture that absorbs all the negative energy. That was super cool. Um, this might be a more personal question, but do you believe that your sculptures, like the rock ones, have made a positive impact on people, like in terms of healing them or cleansing them of negative energy? Oh, I always get this question. <laughs> And I never know how to answer. No, I know how to answer it. Um, so here's how I think it works. Um, and it, uh, so I was going to say it relates to the cult leaders. Like I, <laughs> so here's what I think. Like, so I have them in my house. There's two over here. I won't show you my house because well, it's pretty clean in that direction. Um, so here's what I've thought. Like, I think about this all the time and people ask and I'm like, what am I gonna say? Here's what I'm gonna say. Like, so you see the sculpture, right? It's, you see, you read the little label, it tells you what it is. And whether it like, the way that it works is like, now you're thinking about this idea of this magic sculpture healing you, right? And so like, if you go for the ride, then it works, right? And like, I've literally had people, and you know, this is not, well, what, what, what do I want to say? So that's the idea, right? And I've literally had people come up to me and say, like when I had the one at Penn State, it was kind of fun. I had it up for the whole school year. People would come up to me and say like, every day I go up and I hug that thing and it makes me feel so good, right? Like they just like kind of embrace the idea of it and like they pass it every day and it makes them think about this thing. And that's how it works, right? It's like subtle magic. And, and you know, and the performances, um, I think are a little less subtle. Like they're really like, well, you know, Mindy can speak to it. I don't want to sell it up too much. I don't know how I did that day that you saw the one, but like, the, it's like a real experience. It's like going to a concert, right? And you're like, you go in one year, like, oh man, what's for lunch? And you know what I mean? You kind of, and you go, you have this experience. And when you leave there, like you just feel different, right? You're like, it's just really, you know? So that's the idea of it. That's kind of the model and that's how it works, right? And you walk away thinking about that. And so I always think about like, if you had one of these things in your house, like I do, and I'm like getting all upset and I'm ready to start, you know, arguing with my wife about some silly thing. And I look over at that thing and I'm like, man, I need to chill out. You know, <laughs> like, like, it's just like a touchstone, like a reminder, like, Hey, what about that magic? You know, what about that negative energy stuff? And so I think that there's like practical ways. And then, you know, we can all, um, there's practical ways that it works, but also I think bigger than that, you know, our, our belief in these things is what I'm really interested in, this idea of belief. Yeah, yeah, of yeah I think that, that's that's one of the reasons too why, um, uh, like that, that experience, seeing that performance and being around um, the object uh, during that festival has, has been in my mind for a long time. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why you're you're here with us, uh, mm -hmm. and so yeah, it um, uh, it's it's hard to describe because mm -hmm. you, yeah, you really it's so so kind of cliche to say that you you know you have to you have to be there, but um, uh, I think I think that you all are getting a good sense, you know, even just from the the videos and the description that um, Rudy has shared. Uh, um, Judy Gilmore, the director of our gallery, had a related question. And then uh, I know Sarah Richards has a question, but I want to circle back to one of our other panelists. So, okay. Thanks, guys. Um, Rudy, thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. And um, I just love your work. I think it's so wonderful that you are getting attention now. I wish that the world was always giving attention to this kind of work, but I can't help but hear that you do want your work to function and it is functional art in a way, you know, mm -hmm. both the sculptures, but even in your portraits, I mean, it is about changing people's kind of hearts and minds or the way that they approach very complicated things with a kind of human first approach. Um, but I'm curious just about your own spirituality and, and how does that fit into all of this and does it? Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, it definitely does, right? Like this all, um, man, that is a question I don't get very often or quite like that. It's like, oh boy, really, I got to talk about myself actually. But yeah, like it, it, it's all related to that, right? Because it's the stuff I'm talking about and making work about is all like the stuff I'm trying to like, um, I'm working on within myself, right? Like to be this person that can be sort of like, um, empathetic that can be really like understanding and not just reactive and sort of uh prejudiced in a way like oh I don't like people that do that you know what I mean like that kind of stuff whether it be petty little stuff or like bigger um things right and so um you know I have things that I do like I meditate every day and you know what I mean like I list I'm obsessed with this guy named Ram Das, who I've made like paintings of and you know and he always talks about you know like trying to um well he has this crazy idea this really crazy idea that I love that I'm gonna I can't believe I'm gonna say in this lecture but this idea that you and me are two different people is like not true like we're all just one person and not like in a we are all one, like peace and love, like, like literally this idea that like, I'm one person named Rudy and I'm like over here is this fully formed thing. And you're this other fully formed thing over here is like, just sort of like a fallacy. And that's sort of based on sort of Hinduism and stuff like that. So I get way out with this stuff and, and really like to like, think about that. And what would that mean? And how do you live that? And he's like very interesting because he talks about it in a very practical way. But so I, you know, I, I don't need to get into all my crazy spiritual um, beliefs, but I definitely like, ultimately like what probably everybody can relate to is just like trying to like um and I think a lot of work that people were doing this summer which was so interesting to me um was like really like checking ourselves like you know like what you know like we think we're like doing a good job I'm a good person but like what am I doing how am I you know what am I doing to help out you know and you know, my answer is, you know, for whatever it's worth is like, I'm doing this work, I'm giving these talks, I'm like, really like sticking my neck out there and speaking my mind, like in these situations. I really, you know, because I'm not a get out in the street and rah, rah, march, like that just doesn't resonate like with my heart. So it's like, I got to find a way to, but I'm very interested in the world changing and how I can contribute to that. But you know, and so, so it's this way, right? This seems like this is, whatever we like each of us have our gifts right and it's sort of like making this work and doing it in a certain way that people find interesting is then my way of sort of then like in bringing in the message with it that hopefully changes things so yeah boy I don't know how no that's perfect thank that you is. I appreciate yeah, yeah. it Sarah did you did you want to ask your question yeah um I actually have two questions but first I wanted to say that um, on your portraits of the like the criminals, I appreciate that you also do portraits of the victims because a lot of times we like like idolize like the yeah. the criminals and a lot of times the names of the victims get lost yeah. and that's kind of wrong. So I appreciate that you do that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. My first question was in the Situation Room, was there a reason why Biden was so much smaller than everybody else in the room? Oh, I saw that. You wrote that in the chat. Yeah. Did you write and that in the chat? Yeah. Okay. The second question was, do you ever have issues with photographers and like copyright issues with painting some right, of their right, works? Right. I haven't. No, I haven't had that issue. Um, I think that um, I talked to somebody about this or something. It's like sort of fair use or something like that. Like they somebody like really looked into it for me and they said like I changed it enough like the transformation from the portrait to like the the photograph to the painting it's like enough of a change for it to not be an issue um so the Biden painting like sometimes I, I, I didn't talk about it this time but like it's very weird and warped and like actually one of the like here I'll just show you real quick there's a lot of funny things happening in that painting um hold on That's, uh, what's her name's Ashram. Hold on, I gotta like pull it up and then I'll show it to you. So the Biden paint, the, the situation room painting was one of the, when I first started doing these scenes and I was doing them like very much like freehand, like just looking at the thing and trying to replicate it, which I don't do anymore because I'm not very good at it. I guess if I kept practicing, I would have gotten better, but um. All right, I gotta share my screen again. 
because there's some funny stuff in that painting that I don't know if anybody noticed. So yeah, so there's like the perspective of the room, right? So he's smaller just because he's back here and that guy's bigger, but that got really warped. Like he's like a child here. <laughs> like if they all stood up next to each other, he'd be like four feet tall and that guy'd be like eight feet tall. Uh, so that's one thing. But then I don't know if you noticed, there's like this body here and then, then there's this disembodied head over <laughs> here. Like I drew, I think I drew the faces and then I drew the bodies and I was like, oh, wait a minute. I think that body goes to that head. That just happened when I was doing it. So, um, so there's a lot of weird stuff like that that just happened like, um, cause I don't know what I'm doing or I didn't know what I was doing. I know more now. I actually teach this drawing class and we do perspective and we, <laughs> one of my students is here. <laughs> so this is way before I ever taught it. And I was like, oh yeah, that's how that works. I sort of was just like seeing, noticing it and like it gets all warped, but it's just fun stuff that happens. I think it makes it interesting. That is, that is one of the things that like I really appreciate about um, the paintings and just your approach, I think to the making in general is that you're, you're not going to deny yourself, uh, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the method that you need uh, to understand this situation or this mm -hmm. person, right? So, so even though you're, you know, you're like, oh, I, I didn't know what I was doing then, you didn't let that stop you, exactly. you know, yeah. from, from, from doing the thing. And so I, I find that I, I, well, I find that very inspiring and, and I think it, you know, I'm sure resonates with, uh, a lot of the students who are here today. Um, I know that JD had uh, an additional question and, and so did um, Cheyenne. So uh, JD, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, um, I have two questions. I'll try to make it quick. One of them, are, one of them is a little bit longer, but um, uh, so yeah. So I was thinking about how like me growing up, I didn't really have that much art around me. Mm -hmm. at least art that I seen myself in you know yeah. um so I guess my question is what was art instilled in your household growing up um or was it something that you found yourself and just grew into um and now that you have your own family how have you instilled art in your household and, 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 oh the PS part of the question is um how has your art or your practice made you appreciate your relationship or has strengthened your uh, connection with your father and son? Are these conversations that you guys talk about, like what you're talking about in art? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, good questions. Um, so yeah, and it's cool that my mom's here. because So when I was a kid, my um, I just rem I have this fond memory of my mom like was really into collecting like African-American art. And so we were living in Houston when we would go around to these different art galleries and she would buy these art pieces and look through. And I just remember, I don't know, I must've been 10, 11 or something like that, going to these art galleries and then she'd buy things and get it framed. And then we'd have them up in the house and I would just like, look at them. And this is like, I'm making art, like little drawings and action figures and drawing monsters and stuff. I'm not thinking I'm an artist or anything like that, but this art is like kind of around me. And it was a lot of, you know, like I said, a lot of, uh, figure portraiture and stuff like that and so yeah I guess you know I didn't um, think a lot about it right so so that was always around me um, but then I you know I didn't think I was an artist and so I was doing all the different things I was doing and then I went to school and started making art and it was a different kind of art and so it almost seemed like it wasn't connected you know it was almost like a different experience it was David Hammond's all this kind of weird contemporary art and political art but just like in a different way and so I had another vision of another type of art that was made, but um, I think having that kind of background, I'm sure like um, tune my eyes up or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, um, but it was cool to go to college and see like uh, another, you know, lots of, here's all these other things artists do, you know, and see just a wild range of things. Um, and then you asked about, um, do I sort of, show art to my kids and stuff like that and I do definitely like I um I'm pausing because so, so with a lot of the projects some of the things I've shown you in some earlier ones like I've had my like my mom has helped make things that have been part of sculptures and stuff like that she sews and I did the sculpture and it had these um 
she made this costume once, not the healer, but another character that I had. And she made these like cushions that were in this installation. And like, so we've collaborated. Um, my son has been in performances. My daughter has been in performances. Like they come with me. Like my son is now like 18 and like he's gone with me um, on trips and we've like made sculptures together. We're going to do that again this summer. And um, and, you know, they're both creative in their own right. I don't know if they'll be artists or anything, but, you know, I've they've sort of seen like all sides of it, right? Like the dirty, like, all right, we got to carry all this wood over to here or whatever. And I'll end like the opening where the fancy, you know, like cheers, you know, the wine. Like I want them to, to get the full picture, not just like the fancy, like pats on the back or he talks. It's like, here's the everyday, like chopping wood and carrying water side of it too. And so they've definitely gotten like insights of, and their mom's an artist as well, you know, so they've definitely got that insights. Um, so your other question was about if my father and son, if we've talked about, um, I'm assuming you're talking about sort of like Black Lives Matter stuff and like the police and all that, right? Um, yeah, we've definitely talked about that stuff. We talked about it a lot this summer, which I keep bringing it up because it's like, you know, it's so poignant and it just happened. Um, so it's just fresh on my mind. Um, yeah, I had an experience, I guess I, I had this experience when I was making the painting of Trayvon Martin. And like, I, you know, my son is, you know, I took a picture of him and then, you know, to make the painting. And, and so he's like, why are we taking this picture? And I was like, oh, you know, the Trayvon Martin and you're going to be Trayvon Martin. He's like, I don't want to be Trayvon Martin. And it was like, whoa, you know, he was like 10 or something. I was like, no, I don't want you to be Trayvon, you know, like in the sense of I don't want this to happen to you. It was like a real profound moment in the midst of like come over here come over here let's just take this picture you know like I was just like I want to take the picture to do this thing and it was sort of like it just brought it made it real you know and so you know things like that have happened and we talk about this stuff when it happens go to protest together and stuff like that um yeah um okay thank you I really appreciate that that was a long question but a very <laughs> long no it was good yeah I brought up some some topics that I haven't <laughs> talked about yeah thank you well, my last little question was just kind of for me, I guess. Um, I went on your Instagram and like I stalked it or whatever, and I seen that you had um, a portrait of MF Doom, which I thought was really dope to see. Yeah, um, yeah. So, like, is music part of your process in like any way? Um, and like, I guess, are the music or genres or whoever you listen to, like, how does their craft inspire inspire your craft in a way? Right, right, right. Yeah, music is huge in my life. Like I love, like I made the reference to going to concerts. I love going to concerts and just have been to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I'm not exaggerating. Um, always listening to music in the studio. Um, like, you know, like when I say artists, like I mean like musicians, writers, poets, you know, everybody, you know, and so I see them at, all, us as all kind of a group trying to do this thing like we're kind of the other people <laughs> that aren't like building buildings and like I don't know like making money we're like doing this we have these wild ideas and so I'm always inspired by people what they're doing and you know someone like MF Doom like kind of like carving out some new realm you know and like connecting rap and like comic you know comics and you know and just his creativity and his mastery and so you know when he passed away you know definitely gonna make a portrait of him and kind of honor him up there with everybody else right with my Angelo you know like he's our my Angelo you know like I don't see like oh you know poetry you know is up here and raps down here you know I'm seeing it all as a, you know a project that we're all doing right and so I'm very inspired by that um was there another part to that question I feel like I was supposed to get to something else um maybe not I think you I think you answered it pretty much okay okay cool I'll leave it there and then <laughs> I'm sure there are other questions but yeah I could talk up all night Diane all of it. <laughs> but I'll stop Diane did you have another question for Rudy um I did so um, on the Penn State's like College of Arts and Architect Architecture page, um, in the short bio, it said the series is on one hand a response to living in New York City for the last 12 years and witnessing the madness that takes place in the American microcosms. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn for the last 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. so I think I kind of understand what you meant, but yeah. for some other folks who are here who may not understand the city dynamics or the madness. Yeah. Um, 
could you please explain like what about New York City's atmosphere and the madness and your 12 years there contributed to the series? Right, okay. Ooh, good question. Research question. So um, I think what I was speaking about is just like what it's, I mean, let's pre-pandemic, let's, let's talk about that world because right now I'm just in this bubble. I could be anywhere almost, not really, but kind of. But like before the pandemic, you're riding the train, everybody's mixing together, right? Like sometimes people are getting in arguments or physically fight, type people physically fighting in the train on the way to work in the morning, right? Crazy things happen. And then you'll hear somebody's playing the violin, like, you know, like for money on in, it's just like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Or like you walk through Central Park and the sun hits you in a certain way. It's like, it's just all available. And like, you just don't know from day to day as you go through the city doing whatever you have planned, like what of those things you'll see and experience. And that, you know, it's just so complex. And so, you know what I mean? Like the good and the, the best and the worst of it all, you know, is all happening. And you see people like, okay, so people fought on the train, but also like people laughing together, joking together, like singing a song, you know, like people dancing and everybody cheering. Like, you know, it's not all bad things that happen on the subway. You know, it's just that those, mo I've had those kind of moments where it's just like, oh my God, I can't believe we're all having this beautiful, happy, ridiculous, you know, thing happen. I don't know if you've had those experiences. And then you get the stereotypical, like everybody's tough and nobody wants to speak. And that's true too, you know? So it's, that's what I'm trying to talk about. It's just sort of like that life is super complex and it's all just at play. Um, in New York and, you know, to judge it and to say, oh, you know, you, you can't say New York is just this thing, you know, it's it's scary, it's this, it's good, it's bad. It's a, it's all of the things, right? And it's it's a kind of, to categorize it is to limit what, you know what I mean? To like simplify it, right? And so that's the work is like that, right? It's like when I showed that one where it's like my Angelo and my dad's sleeping, he looks like he's dead and that's sad to me versus, you know, some soccer player for, you know, it's like, I'm trying to speak to, to that complexity um, as much as I can, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. Does that make, does that answer your question? No, it did perfectly. Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Happy to hear that. There's something in the chat. I wonder if it's a question. Oh, that's for everybody. Are, are there other questions? Feel free to use the chat if that's where you feel comfortable asking or you can speak up here. Mindy, I feel like there was something you said that I wanted to pick up on, but we can leave it. What were you talking about before those questions happened? Do you remember even? Oh, uh, um, uh, I, I said something to the effect of uh, just in relation to you responding to Sarah's question about, you know, the funny scale that's happening in the painting. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I want. Situation to room. And I was like, oh, I, I yeah. really inspired and uh, excited by the fact that that you didn't let like not knowing exactly like how to deal with that like stop you from yeah letting that you know getting something out of that process um you know finding understanding or trying to uh you know um uh kind of get get uh you know just just some education from yeah. through that act of painting the scene uh, you know, that you just didn't, you didn't deny yourself like that exploration because you didn't know the process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's feel, what I wanted I to I guess, confident in the process. You knew the process, but maybe you didn't feel confident in it yet. Yeah, I wanted to, that's what I wanted to pick up on. I just, I mean, maybe it's a good way to, to close. It's just to, um, for, to whatever, I don't know. I, I, that's been kind of a motto of mine. Like I just sort of, if I want to do something, I'll just like jump in. Like I was saying, like, I don't know how to make figurative sculptures and I'm not going to read a book about it and learn before I do it. I'm just going to do it and see what happens. And from my experience, that's way more interesting than like, if I like went over to the New York Art Academy and took a class and learned how to like, you know, all the forms and all that. And so, you know, I wanted to make ceramics. And so I was just like, give me a lump of clay. And just, you know, they're like, here's what you have to do. So it doesn't explode. And I was like, all right. <laughs> and then I just, 
and you know my colleagues are like yeah keep going that's great yeah yeah yeah. they didn't explode it's really it's really different than anything anybody else who knows how to do ceramics is doing and just kind of trusting that you know like having had that experience there and here you know I would just encourage people um and I try to like when I talk to my students right you know I teach sculpture and most people have never done it I'm just like, just jump in there. The best way to learn how to do it is just to like throw yourself in the deep end and have some idea you're trying to express and you'll figure stuff out on the way. Um, yeah, and I, so, I think taking those yeah. risks is like, is so crucial um, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. to, you know, anything, not just a creative process, you know? Uh, yeah. And so, um, uh, yeah, that I think, um, really resonates uh, for our audience. Um, there, there are uh, uh, two questions that came in while you were discussing that. Um, okay. uh, Ruth Martin asks, were you always non-judgmental and empathetic or did that develop later in your life? Um, hmm. You'd have to ask somebody that knows me. <laughs> Um, I think that, so here's what that makes me think about. I remember when I was an undergrad, you know, I was in the South. This is, I don't know that the time period matters, but it was like the late nineties. It was like, you know, North Carolina, there were like slave stocks. There was this like block and it was like, oh yeah, they used to sell slaves over there. So all my work was about like race and the history of black people in America and slavery. And it was very like black and white, right? I was just like, this terrible stuff happened we all got to like look at it like take a good look at this yeah you know and it was very um and so people would just come to my shows and they're like oh man i feel really bad i'm sorry that that happened or they get defensive and they say like i didn't do it i wasn't there i didn't do it you know and so i was just like you know i got sort of sick of that right just kind of smashing people over the head like you know and so i remember going to grad school and and having people really not challenge that specifically, like, oh, those, you know, it's, it's, but just having my, you know, understanding that the world is much more complex and there's more, and just finding like some gray in there. And, um, and also I think it's sort of a, the nature of getting older, I think you start to be like, oh, I, well, there's this other side of it. You can look at it like this or like that, or I don't know if it's, everybody does that, or if it's just me, but I just sort of start to see every it's like a, it's hard to have an opinion at all because you're just like well what about this and what about that and if you look at it this way and if you you know and so that's just some process that's been happening and I think it does have something to do with age I think when you're a teenager you're in your 20s it's like oh you know like the man and you know it's just sort of like it's just it's the time to be that way and then as you get older it's sort of like maybe you see a few more things or I don't know you just sort of start to see other angles or something like that, you know? And so that's sort of, so I think it's been a process is all that, all that to say that is my answer. I, I think the thing um, that is interesting in that uh, response is that, uh, you know, kind of trusting yourself, like trusting, um, uh, trusting what you know, even if there is a lot of unknown in that, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or, you know, and also like leaving, leaving room, leaving room for, instead of like, you know, trying to have this like mm -hmm. definitive, like, this is it, um, you know, leaving room for your continued exploration as the artist, but also, um, you know, a lot of thinking and questions that the audience might have about what they're, what they're seeing. Um, uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, just to, cause I think you're getting to like the better part of the point, which is that I think the work has more room in it or over time had, had more and more room for people to interpret it different ways and like kind of come up to me and say like, oh, to me, it's about this, or do you know, or they know some other part of the story. That I don't even know. It's like, did you know this person did this or that? Or, and, and, and that's just like way more interesting and like kind of progresses things forward as you learn more you know um you know as I've been like kind of making these sort of healing sculptures I'm constantly people are coming up to me and telling me about things that are similar to it and I go explore that and that I run into something else and you know it's just sort of there's that room in there um which I think is good work is you know about something but also there's like room 
to take it another way or something. Yeah, but you were gonna say something else or ask him. Oh, that. yeah, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Ali uh, Schaefing had a question uh, in the chat. The story of being sued was fascinating and made me wonder, have you ever connected directly with any of the victims or criminals you've depicted? Um, good question. You know, I another thing I forgot to talk about is, so now what I do is since Instagram started, what was that, 10 years ago, 11 years ago? I, what I do is I'll, I used to just make the work and it sits in a box and then I have a show maybe a year later, or two years later, and then it all comes out. People come see the show. They forget half of the stories because it's been a couple of years. Um, but now like I make the work and I put it on Instagram, like when I make it and it's usually shortly after things happen. And so people see it in real time and react and respond. Um, so it's led to kind of conversations with, you could call the audience, you know, people that are seeing the work, but it's also led to people related to the stories reaching out to me. Um, and, um, I've had, I made a portrait of this guy that, um, these two men in New York, upstate New York, they escaped from jails like four years ago or something like that. And this woman helped them and it was like, ha ha ha, they tricked her the son of one of those guys reached out to me on Instagram and said, Hey, I just found this picture of my dad. You know, this is really cool. And I was so glad that I just right, made a picture of him on his portrait of him story was this guy escaped from jail. This is what happened. I didn't paint him as a villain. I didn't, you know what I mean? I didn't embellish the story or shape it in this direction or that it was just the information. Um, I had it just happen just recently. Oh, MF Doom's son reached out to me. It was almost like maybe a month ago. It was after it had been up for a while. He finally saw it and he was like, man, this is so cool. He made this painting of my dad. And so that's freaking amazing, right? Like that's kind of who it's for, right? If like his son or whoever, his partner, you know? And so it's, it's with social media, it's sort of like possible that that happens, you know, with like hashtags and being public and all that. And so that's been super interesting and definitely keeps me on my toes, right? It's like, well, you know, People or people related to the story may actually see it and it's happened several times. So I better get it right. Or, you know what I mean? Just kind of be honest, be kind of, you know, uh, do it in the way that I feel good about, I guess is what I mean to say. Yeah. But yeah, I would have forgot to talk about that. Whole, I would have forgot to tell you that story if you hadn't asked that question. So thanks for asking. Other questions from folks? Um, there is another question in the chat if you've seen, Mindy. I wasn't sure if you did. Did I miss something? Um, it was right before Ali's. Oh, and then my dad wrote a comment. Wait a minute. Hmm. Whoa, that's cool. I don't know if you guys saw the comment from my dad. I was remembering back to those first shows. Yeah. Was there another question in the chat? I, I didn't see another one that I that we didn't talk about. The one from Ruth JD. Uh yeah. Yeah, I, I asked I asked their question. The non-judgmental, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, but there might have been something that I missed also. Yeah, I think so. Uh Rudy, um, uh, do you have what's what's next? Like, I, I mean, to, could we where could we see your work? I know that these are strange times, but do you mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. anything you know coming up where we might be able to uh, see one of the performances or see your work displayed? Um, yeah, well, you can follow me on Instagram. I post my stuff literally like when I make it, so it's much more actually up to date than my website. Um, but I'm also, I'm doing the 1-54 uh, art fair, which is uh, primarily artists of African descent. Um, and that's in May, May 17th through the 23rd. I think it's online. Um, so you can definitely see that. I am doing, doing a piece in Canada, if I can go there. <laughs> Which I don't know that I can go there. I, I think I can go there now and I, hopefully it stays that way, but I'm making a sculpture and I'm doing a workshop with a group of, uh, of kids 
um, this summer, like in June, uh, one of the negative energy absorber sculptures. Um, those are the things I have coming up. Um, probably gonna have a show at my gallery, Latchkey Gallery, but not sure yet. We're waiting to see when the pandemic's gonna end and we can do in-person things. Sure. But if you follow me on Instagram, you'll find out about all of these things when they happen. Honestly, if you're interested. Sounds good. We will do it. All right. We will do it. Uh, Rudy, this has been amazing. Um, uh, student panelists, thank you so much for, and everyone here, uh, thank you so much for your amazing questions. Um, this has been a lot of fun. I feel like we have uh, a lot to think about, um, a lot to process. Uh, and uh, that's that's what a great artist lecture is. So thank you, Rudy. Um, awesome, thanks. For sharing, it's been amazing. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you all for you know sticking around for the whole thing and for your great questions. Great uh, job, yeah. Rudy. Great thank job. You. That's my mom. <laughs> Thanks for coming, mom <laughs> and dad and sis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glad you can make it. Thank you. And Benjamin, <laughs> thank my you. student. Thanks for coming. If you're still here. Oh, he's yeah, still I'm here. still here. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. It was, it was <laughs> really really cool to, to see your artwork. Honestly, it's really amazing. I, oh. I didn't think you had like this whole whole diverse different kind of uh uh I guess like I don't know um like detail or or or, or things to do. It was, it was really, really cool. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for coming and saying that. That's sweet. Cool. I have to say though, right before I leave, I love how your parents kind of are like involved in this um mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. panel with yeah. us um and that support is very like you know it's like really refreshing so shout out to you for having great parents <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad they're here to hear it yeah yeah they're great they're great definitely and they come out to the shows and these wild performances i'm like all right well they came man i just gotta, gotta give them the real experience i can't clean you know they'll be over by time we <laughs> Rudy, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah, okay, go for, for it. For some reason, I've been trying to talk to you for a little bit, and I oh. really appreciate your work. And, oh, I can't uh, hear you very well. Actually, it's like muted. It's quiet. Can you hear me better? Yeah, that's better. That's better. Go okay, ahead. I'm just saying that uh, as your dad, I have seen your work evolve from Wake Forest all the way through, you know, some of your installations, some of your specials, Cohegan, mm -hmm. all of these things had an impact on, on your art, what mm -hmm. was coming out. Definitely. And I could see that, yeah. uh, you know, and I'm just amazed and very appreciative of how you express yourself freely. You know, that's good to have that freedom. And, and just like we talk a lot, and I share, and you share. Mm -hmm. So this gives you some ideas, hopefully, because I do a lot of reading and research. Yes. So I try to share that with you as much as I can give you little doses. <laughs> yeah, my dad's a political yeah. junkie. He's always reading them <laughs> all the biographies. He keeps me on my toes for that stuff. Very good, Rudy, keep up the yeah, good work. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. <laughs> That's good. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, Rudy. Have a great night, everyone. All right. Yeah. Take care. That's good. She must be one of the directors. That's it. All right. So were some of the people um, that are going to be at the thing on Friday, were they here tonight that will participate in the, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there were, there were a lot of students here, a lot of, a lot of names that I, I recognized, at least from um, art and design. Uh, mm -hmm. So cool. yeah, and I, there's, you know, our, our department, um, art and design and uh, the visual um, side, uh, like we've, we've recently joined uh, as one, which is exciting. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's gonna, there's probably 
probably this whole other group of students who I just, you know, didn't didn't recognize because, you know, we're, we're it's fairly new this gotcha. uh, right. um, this yeah. But I think that there were also a lot of students from uh, one of our uh, like maybe one or two of our um, gen ed classes. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so that was that was exciting that we had you know a couple of different like kind of campus communities here tonight. That was really nice. Yeah, nice. Yeah, thanks, Rudy. It was a great yeah. talk, and I love seeing all the work and all the stories. Just awesome. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Cool. Well, so I go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, uh, one of the other professors from um, the art and design. Uh, Part of the department, uh, uh, William Fillmore is here. Billy Fillmore. Uh, hey, how's it going? Hi. I just turned my camera on. I figured it would, since we were closing off, I might as well say thanks in person. Oh, cool. That's cool. pretty great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Will you be there on Friday? Are you involved in this crazy? Yeah, situation? it should be around on Friday. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I've let my I've let my uh, photo one students know, and that class is really great because it's a even mix um, nine non majors and nine art majors. So uh, mm -hmm. you know, there I was like, we're gonna be in a workshop on Friday, and uh, I don't really know what's gonna happen, but I'm gonna be here with you, and we're gonna do you know whatever we're gonna do. And they were just looking at me like what do you mean and i was like it's gonna be awesome that's all you need to know <laughs> <laughs> i'll see you friday it's gonna be awesome yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome awesome yeah. yeah yeah that's a good preemptive so they're just gonna show up it's like what the hell is this gonna be yeah, yeah, yeah. it's gonna be great perfect be perfect yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. we'll hit them yeah. with some, some fun stuff yeah thanks again rudy appreciate it yep. yeah thank you so awesome. much thanks, we'll, yeah yeah, yeah. We'll you guys you have a great friday. night all awesome. right you too all right take care Hi, Natalie. Thanks for coming. <laughs>